It looks like the numbers are slowing down a bit. Um, hello, everyone. This is Susanna Howison, and uh, welcome to the second of our DOE Laboratories of the Workshop series. Our first workshop on scientific architecture was held at the end of September and was a great success. If anyone missed it, we do have a recording and our, um, it will be online soon, but if, before that happens, please just send me an email and I'm happy to share it with you. <clears throat> and today we're going to be speaking about the geography of innovation or place-based innovation models, including innovation districts, research parks, cluster associations, and open campuses. These models leverage existing research institutions, universities, and industries to establish clusters of innovation and spur regional economic development. Before we get to our fantastic lineup of speakers, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Chris Fall, the Director of the Office of Science, for a brief introduction. I'm the non-fantastic speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you did That's not okay. make the cut. <laughs> no, okay. uh, boy, um, well, look, uh, welcome to the workshop and, and, and thanks for participating. Um, as Susanna said, this is one in a series uh, in the labs, uh, laboratories of the future effort that we have going on. Um, and I, you know, just want to say uh, that uh, Susanna has done a great job. Susanna and the team, I'm incredibly excited about what they're doing with the, the wider effort. Um, you know, strategic, we do a lot of planning in the Office of Science and at the Department of Energy. And I, you know, we certainly also do strategic planning. And uh, in, in my, when I think about strategic planning, I think about, you know, we know where we are and we know kind of where we want to go in the near to mid uh, term. And we need to figure out how to get there and what resources we need. That's not what Laboratories of the Future is all about. Uh, in, in contrast, really, uh, Labs of the Future, we'll shorthand it there, um, is essentially to start with a clean sheet of paper and contemplate the purpose of public science, right? The purpose of laboratories in particular, but uh, public science and ask how we might envision this thing that we do if we didn't already have the amazing labs that we have, right? Uh, so. Labs of the future is meant to be free of the actual, you know, practical concern of implementing the vision. It's meant to generate ideas. It's meant to, to ask what if. It's meant to be aspirational. Uh, maybe uh, some of the ideas that we generate are going to be so attractive that we do want to reach for them and incorporate them and incorporate them into our, our near uh, or, or midterm strategic thinking. But Frankly, that's for another day, right? We want to enjoy the process that we're undertaking of, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? That's what the labs uh, of the future is all about. And uh, so it's, you know, been enjoyable so far. Um, you know, I, I should say that the Department of Energy Laboratories, if, if you're joining us and you're not intimately familiar with them, they're really the crown jewels of the, the nation's research enterprise, uh, at least on the on the public side, and frankly, the envy of the world. Right? They have these what we call superpowers: science at scale. You know, big science uh, uh, can be accelerators, colliders, really big, physically big, and also big in terms of the people that are involved. Um, we we uh, are good at convergence of the disciplines so that we, you know, when we, at, we attack a problem or we're interested in something, we can bring all sorts of folks together. And of course, we do have this uh, incredible, uh, at our labs, this incredible array of really world unique user facilities. I mentioned the, you know, the x-ray light sources, the neutron sources, the collide, etc. Um, but uh, you know, this complex of, uh, at least in the Department of Energy, 17 labs, 10 of those are Office of Science. It's uh, entering its eighth decade of existence, and our roots are 
World War II, the Cold War, you know, inward looking, so forth. And so um, in the Office of Science, it's our job to make sure these laboratories um, are positioned uh, to thrive for the next 70 years. We've done pretty well so far, and, and that's, you know, really why we um, are trying to explore this vision with the laboratories of the future uh, exercise. So, you know, again, the core question is, what, what would the DOE laboratories be like um, if we had the, the power to make them any way that we wanted, right? What would the infrastructure look like? Uh, if we didn't start, again, uh, with our Cold War roots uh, with fences and uh, the security posture that, that we had, what, what would the physical structure be? Um, distributed, more virtual, maybe a mix of public facilities and private facilities uh, that's more uh, integrated with the region and its communities. That's a little bit of a topic for today. What about human capital? Um, how can what's you know what's the, the the way to create the optimal environment for a diverse and inclusive workforce that attracts the best? Right, we want people to want to be uh, at our laboratories. Um, and what about impact? Right. So, in addition to the basic and applied science, what can the labs do for our country in other dimensions? Uh, think about preparing uh, and employing a technology workforce, right? Uh, you know, a, a part of the pipeline for the, the wider uh, S&T for the country. So, <clears throat> and, and critically, what about governance? This is a big question. What, what's the best model uh, for a relationship with the Department of Energy, uh, our other universities, our other private sector, our other stakeholders? Um, that's uh, something we're examining all the time. So. Look, we're looking uh, to the entire stakeholder community for ideas, including you all. Uh, one of the ways we're generating these ideas is with these workshops. And the first one was really cool. It was about, uh, uh, that Susanna mentioned, um, really this, this examination of scientific facilities like our user facilities, but through the perspective of architecture and design. It was a lot of fun and exactly the kind of generative exploratory thinking that we're trying to, to do with the whole effort and these convenings uh, in particular. And so uh, today we're talking about the geography of innovation. It's about the role of our labs, uh, our labs, potential future labs in, in the techno-economic context of a region, uh, maybe a city, uh, maybe a wider region, whatever spatial scale makes sense. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not limiting that. Um, how does science infrastructure contribute to and interact with everything from the economy to the identity of a place? We have five really remarkable speakers who are going to discuss this idea of place-based innovation models, including innovation districts, research parks, uh, cluster associations, and open campuses. Um, you know they're going to they're going to share their strategies uh, and their ideas, and uh, you know we'll hopefully have a conversation and explore those. So um, anyway, uh, and, and in particular, um, I would say that, uh, you know, one thing that we're focused on at a place like the Department of Energy is we have these ideas, how do we make them happen? What are the policy levers uh, that uh, on the Department of Energy, on the federal side, on the state and local side uh, that we need to, you know, the knots that we might be tied in that we need to comb through to make these uh, sorts of ideas possibilities. So the, the policy side is really important. So anyway, enough from me. Uh, I really want to thank our speakers up front for, for participating, and you all for participating uh, today. Can't wait to, to hear what comes out of this. And of course, just an, another huge thanks to Susanna and her team uh, here at the Department of Energy for uh, their creativity in taking this laboratory of the future uh, exploration in really exciting and interesting directions. So uh, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, so first uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker now. This is Dr. Anastasia Konstantinova. She's an economic consultant with a focus on quantitative and qualitative industry analysis cluster promotion and business and economic growth. She wrote her doctoral thesis on cluster policies in the Basque County in Spain and Upper Austria and worked as a researcher at Orchestra, the Basque Institute of Competitiveness. Dr. Constantinova will be speaking about regional cluster policy and economic development using European case studies. 
and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna, for a great introduction. And um, it's a uh, high pleasure to be here and to share the experience of the Basque Country in particular in terms of the cluster policy. And I think this is part of the idea sharing that uh, Chris Paul just mentioned, how do we make them happen? So the Basque Country is kind of a nice example of uh, how they try to make uh, the cluster policy happen in their region. And um, uh, I like the example because it's quite uh, quite a remarkable one. Um, and especially because of course I did the thesis um, there and worked as uh, so it's kind of also a personal touch along with the professional one. Um, I'll try to go and share now my presentation. Let me see. Um, okay. Does everyone see the presentation? Yes. Right? Yeah. Good. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, basically, as so we have a, a short uh, space to talk, um, and more interesting is actually the dialogue and the conversation and the sharing the ideas. I'll basically focus the presentation on the talk, more seen as a first mon monologue and then uh, apparently discussion uh, with a little bit outside America, so European part um, of um, uh, regional um, and um, regional development innovation strategy and, uh, and uh, focus um, on three main points. Actually, why do we speak about the clusters and um, the case of the Basque country? Then a little bit more in detail in terms of the Basque cluster policy. And uh, as also um, already mentioned more onto Basque association structure and add a couple of other further examples. Um, I guess the presentation could be shared, so there's a little bit more information that I'm going to talk about. Uh, way more is on the slides and um, you can have a look later on and of course uh, uh, get in touch through Susanna um, and uh, yeah, other references. So let me go through why we actually speaking about the glass to policy and um, uh, if you haven't heard, it's quite, I'll tell you later where the best country is, but actually one examples um uh, why the reasons uh, we speak about the vast cluster policy is they have a really long durability of its implementation so it goes way back to almost 1990s and uh, it has the full 30 years of implementation um take it or leave it basically and um it was reflected through different policies but it's still in place and it's still very admired by the regional uh, local government and that's uh, kind of a link to economic development to transformation. Uh, it's not the only policy that has been in place for uh, 30 years. It's also innovation policies or trade policies. But this is one that has um, seen a lot of transformation in different or led to a lot of transformation in different sectors uh, among automotive, for example. And um, uh, as a third point, why it stands out, it was not just about the clusters. It was actually, as you can see on the illustration, it was integrated into a whole framework of regional competitiveness. So also, as um, uh, Chris, uh, for, Chris mentioned, it's, it's about embeddedness basically in the regional context. So clusters are not just standalone pillar um, in that region. It was connected with further uh, dimensions of um, how to um, develop the region and transform it. And then the, basically the experience that I'm sharing, uh, as Susanna well mentioned, um, is through my work uh, with colleagues at Orchestra. Maybe some of you also know James Wilson and uh, Marijo Aranguren. They work a lot, um, not only on the Basque uh, cluster policy and cluster, but also further in the global context of clusters. Uh, this is also where I work as a um, partial consultant, as an expert um, in different uh, networks. And one of those networks where Orchestra is an institute and uh, we through different um, projects were involved is TCI network. It's cluster network of global practitioners um, that has lots of links also um, back to US, the United States, uh, European uh, Commission, and so on. So here on the right side, you can see a couple of the links. They're mostly referred to uh, bus case, but um, if you dig a little bit deeper, deeper there's a wider community of those cluster experts and uh, cluster practitioners, we'll call those who actually uh, work on uh, developing, analyzing uh, how clusters facilitate uh, the regional and uh, well, on some levels also national or city, city dimensions. 
Uh, and finally, most of my work has been reflected either in projects or really specifically on, onto the bus cluster uh, policy in the PhD thesis. Um, and there are a couple of papers you can have a look at. So why actually we speak about clusters? And this is again back into this TCI network, um, global network together with Orchestra. We were invited to write uh, with my colleagues I mentioned and invited to write uh, a paper for their 20th anniversary um, on why actually what has been happening with clusters 20 years um, in the past uh, and what perspective do they have. And we can find lots of different pros and cons, but uh, the numbers say by themselves. You can see on the graph to the left, uh, those dots, small one, this is the period of time, how many, uh, how many basically say, uh, um, how many the word industrial clusters, cluster initiative or cluster policy has been used in the Google Scholar. Of course, it's not very uh, accurate for the beginning up to 2000, but even in, in the period between 2001, 2010, and then 2010, uh, 17, you can see that the interest and the growth and the references of uh, industrial clusters or cluster policy has been really grown and a special cluster initiative. And no wonder we, I think, um, lots have been said, but clusters are interesting because of the external benefits. And I actually came to interest on the clusters is because you can do more if you're connected. You can do, you can get more information. You can uh, have basic closed chains that we could say for the company's it's innovation and special test knowledge has been created in, the, uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that communities. Um, or the networks. Um, it's the product cost, at least, for example, transportation is a very common one that are referred if you have a partner with which you can collaborate close to each other, uh, you cut definitely on transportation costs or search costs. Uh, and of course, business chains like uh, easily contact. So you have a partner next door who can actually uh, connect you um, and give you the right employee or the reference. So as the result, what companies have is higher efficiency, productivity for companies, and uh, we as users get uh, better quality products and services. But what's important, I wanted to also have it the government, like why do they are interested in clusters? And um, from our point, it's like three main uh, issues. It's information, kind of a tool or instrument uh, for policy and a connection. Information, you can get more when you know what kind of sectors or areas you have and you get them through those companies, through technology centers and through structured analysis of your region or territory or city. You have a instrument such as in cluster association as a formal institution that operates there and you have direct um, um, connection to the companies or technology centers through these associations. And I guess already referred to three main uh, terms that we use. It's industrial clusters or clusters, cluster initiatives and cluster policies. So before I go into the uh, saying what is special about or what is interesting actually, not special but interesting about the bus cluster policy, um, I want to recap on like three main terms that we use. Is what is cluster, what is cluster policy, and what is cluster association? You can also hear initiative or organization, but it's mainly all in the area of cluster associations. So for clusters, um, one goes back, of course, to the father of the cluster, um, Michael, um, in his book on competitiveness as uh, an industrial, um, uh, as a conglomeration of companies in simple words, I will say, not citing him. Uh, it's uh, agglomeration, you can see kind of a circle of companies, technology centers, um, and related institutions from the same sector along the value chain. And that leads that if you have this class, it's usually created on a natural level, but policy or um, government institutions can also facilitate its creation. And there's lots of, well, of course, arguments on that. But if we speak about the instruments that kind of done through um, through uh, state institutions, but also through pub private sector or public private sector, we call it cluster policy. So basically on the second line, it's a kind of a box with all instruments that facilitate cluster development. And those instruments, there are numerous ones, and I just slighted three kind of quite common or popular ones is services. This could include like tax reductions or uh, tax reduction or 
um, yeah, information collection from uh, which are uh, funded or not funded from uh, from the state. It's the projects in cooperation, and uh, a third instrument is this cluster associations or cluster initiatives that you've heard. So, uh, what is this cluster association? This is basically uh, either has a formal structure or informal. That means that if it's a formal, it's registered almost like a business institution, like business or company that aims to uh, support or facilitate the clusters in the region. Informal ones is that there might be not registered as a company or they have other forms. Um, also with the formal one, it's, it's could be public private kind of a corporation and it varies over different regions, over different countries. So, um, and, and that's why cluster association is quite of a very broad, but also very concrete model in some of the um, uh, territories. So when I speak about those three terms, that's what we usually understand. And this is crucial because a lot of confusion comes into what is cluster, what is cluster association, cluster policy. Uh, so in our case, uh, especially with my colleagues in orchestra, we, uh, we base uh, our understanding on these three main terms. So the Basque country, um, as I said, it's a little bit outside of, uh, uh, way outside uh, over the ocean uh, from the United States. And if you go back to go to Spain, it's just on the top, um, on the border with France. So Basque country is a community uh, with the headquarter, or well, like, not headquarters, but the capital, Victoria Castells. More people usually know Bilbao, um, but it's rather, because it's more economically strong a center rather than its capital, uh, Victoria Gasteiz. But uh, it's where all the administrative centers are located. Um, and uh, there's also actually wider region uh, close to, um, or uh, where France is part of it as well. Uh, but when we refer to Basque country, it's the um, autonomous community within Spain. And I did just a really brief um, comparison for you with uh, one of the states uh, in the US, New Jersey, uh, because one of the labs, uh, labs, Princeton Pharma Physical Lab, is also located there. So you can see that uh, it's really small, but highly dense. So this was one of the reasons I picked up. So it's also very dense territory uh, as the New Jersey, uh, but it's not comparable neither in area nor into the per capita. So it's way, way smaller, but nevertheless, they are quite remarkable in the European context. And it's uh, one of the top 10 uh, in among um, around 300 uh, regions in, in Europe. So what is, uh, or how does the bus cluster policy look like? It's quite a long one. And uh, I guess in, in a short conversation, we also mentioned about, uh, with Julia Wagner mentioned about the situation, how's the COVID now? And uh, that's what's remarkable about cluster policy. They have long history and uh, they have different periods. You can see on the graph on the top, uh, uh, different periods of their development or evolution of the policy. But even in the last year, um, with my, uh, with the con in the conversation with my colleagues, they already adjusted their policy in terms to reflect um, the situation with COVID. So they um, are now agreed um, uh, to do uh, each association agreed to write a roadmap for their map uh, for their um, for their association, uh, which will be partially uh, co-funded by the government in terms of how they're going to support their companies and institutions in associations in terms of um, uh, their effects from COVID. So this is kind of the latest uh, already actions from them. Up to now, uh, we uh, mostly divide their um, evolution or their, the, the evolution of the policy into four periods. From in, uh, from 90s around 90s up to up to now, and uh, it's nicely illustrated on the graph below, where you can see that it went from regional level up to the global one. It reflects to all the types in terms of the clusters, as natural ones. So they were really first more locally, regionally focused uh, in terms of the cluster policy, its goals and preferences as to the cluster associations and their networks. Um, so basically. In 90s, um, in the first period of time was grounds building. Uh, there was no understanding of what this cluster is, what is cluster policy until um, 
the economy was really uh, going through um, a strong decline and the uh, people in the bus government uh, were looking for different opportunities uh, and uh, options how to develop. They came across the cluster concept, uh, got in touch directly actually with Michael Porter um, and um, uh, their, uh, his um, at that time consultancy helped to develop um, a cluster policy based on analyzing different clusters but at that time you could already see that uh, the government was uh, looking for uh, expertise outside but uh, at the time when they had to look for um, which clusters to support they um, based it also on the local um, local um, knowledge and of local preferences so out of the clusters that has been identified at the time by the Porter's consultancy company they picked up a number of them which they thought as a government were much more relevant and some of the clusters actually that has been supported later on uh, were not reflected in his studies um, um, but uh, basically uh, or primarily on the knowledge of the local companies and institutions so after um, and um, after um, in the 90s, the first mapping of cluster took place in 2000 between 2000 and 2005. Um, all those around uh, 15 clusters were brought into a really good governance structure. And it was not just the working groups uh, trying to uh, facilitate the development of institutions. It was really a more formal and structural approach. And that was up to 2016 when um, they understood they need um, more reviewing of um, new industries. As during uh, basically those uh, around uh, 15 years, uh, industries have evolved. Um, the connections with um, uh, outside of the region has also broadened. Uh, new businesses uh, and new industries uh, services have evolved and that led to the kind of third period where new opportunity new sectors and new industries were giving additional opportunities in the latest uh, since 2013 they did the uh, uh, organizational restructuring uh, basically on how government and cost associations um, are operating and communicating between each other so what um, you could, or you would see on the next slides is um, a little bit on detail of how does cluster policy looks in terms of the cluster analysis, then in terms of the cluster policy uh, and in terms of cluster association, including reference to specific projects and, uh, and, uh, and a coordination of cluster associations. Uh, but I guess um, it's quite uh, quite a lot of information, so I'll just skip those slides with highlighting what's the most interesting and focus on on the organization of cluster associations, how they coordinate with the governance. As I think this is kind of uh, an interesting case for the uh, labs um, in, in our context. But yeah, uh, you can also look uh, look later into uh, individual slides and uh, and uh, open up uh, um, for questions. You know. So um, as mentioned, cluster analysis is wonderfully done in the Basque country and this is uh, partially due to again work of orchestra together with Harvard um, in the framework of uh, um, course of microeconomic of competitiveness. It does not only cluster analysis but also really highlights or creates the same language among the business, uh, research institutions and the policymakers. Then in terms of the cluster policy, as mentioned, has evolved. So it was not only just one paper, one target, one mission uh, from 90s. It has changed its uh, formulation. It has changed its priorities and objectives as the time passed and in alignment with the governance. And as an example, this is the latest development within European uh, program of smart specialization where also clusters have been integrated in smart prioritization within the regions. Uh, also the cluster associations have evolved uh, structurally wise. Um, as you can see on the, um, in the table on the left, the number of cluster associations in the first period was around 12, then only two new appeared in the second period, but then already in the third all those 14 uh, cluster associations have been restructured in two types into cluster and pre-cluster associations dividing them into around adding uh, around 10 more 
uh, and uh, um, those have been again revised um, uh, in cooperation between government and class associations. Um, and this is on the right is the illustration of how do they revised uh, the structure and um, support for the class associations. So um, how actually class associations are, are look like in the Basque country? And this is where I'm gonna focus um, um, a little bit more attention um, is, uh, is illustrated again evolutionary over the last uh, 25, 30 years uh, through four periods. So on the left, um, and you can see where the class associations are uh, through being highlighted in the red circles. So basically in the first period, it was, were not class associations. It was working groups where people were uh, coming together from businesses um, and uh, cooperating um, on, based on different, uh, different ideas and usually around the leading firm. firm. Sometimes also technology centers could have joined, but it was mainly along the uh, main firm. And uh, the government uh, was communicating, the representatives from the government were communicating through the matrix of civil servants. In the next periods, from a second to third period, it has evolved. It has already created a structure um, and it involved not only leading firms, but also government representatives as a part or as a board within the uh, class association. It, it had to also technological centers uh, and, uh, and was regularly kind of a meeting, had a formal structure, but more already, uh, uh, business form of the class association association has evolved in the fourth period where you can see it has a general assembly where they meet regularly they also write um, strategic plans and they are now communicating with the uh, state department uh, with the regional department not only through a matrix of civil servants but through an uh, agency which directly deals with each class association uh, individually and as a group and participates in all their general assemblies and knows a lot about uh, knows a lot about what's happening there. So as you can see, it's already institutional, strongly formed. Uh, Susanna is saying that I'm running out of time, so um, <laughs> I basically um, I highlight two more slides. Uh, where we highlight the lessons learned from the cluster policy and what is interesting. And, uh, as, uh, and they are five points which are worth mentioning. So first of all, what we learned from the bus cluster policy is that it has to be integrated or cluster support, or whatever support you do for the businesses, it has to be integrated into the competitiveness or you could say growth, trade, innovation framework um, or policy agenda, but it shouldn't be a standalone. Through this, it kind of assures common sustainable view towards cluster or innovation uh, support. Then uh, before you start doing anything, do sound analysis and prioritize in a smart way. And uh, that was a basis also for cluster policy in the Basque country. Um, we, saw, so we saw that resources, whether it's from public or private um, uh, side, are really necessary to keep it going and to assure the implementation uh, of the policies done. People really make a difference and it was uh, evident from, from um, those people who were in the matrix of civil servants in the state, uh, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the government at that time, but also now as uh, CEOs or cluster managers, those people who are at the uh, tops of the cluster associations, they do really make a difference. And then finally, the core of a lot of activities which have been done um, by um, class associations is this public-private cooperation or project that have been doing with business, public and research support. And through this, they help especially the research centers, but also business to kind of pass this uh, value of death and avoiding the gap between basic research and business needs. So we think this is kind of key lessons also from cluster policy. But if you're more interested on that, um, you can look on those examples, which I mentioned, which I, um, I've listed here on the uh, next slide. This is in terms of the cluster, a good European Commission references and new CCCP platform. Up Austria is good for cluster policy and Baden-Württemberg. And um, 
there's lots of more projects done in European countries, especially for, uh, for technology centers. And one of them is, for example, um, KET for clean production, where I worked. Um, this is where particularly uh, technology centers were mapped by European Commission and then tried to connect with businesses to make them more efficient. So this is uh, our experience and uh, thank you very much, uh, Susanna and all, and I'm looking forward to hearing other colleagues and participate in discussions if you have further questions. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, just wanted to note, I forgot to mention that if you do have any questions for the speakers, you can put them in the Q&A or the chat and we will go through them at the end once all the speakers have had a chance to present. And now I will uh, switch it over to Mr. Brian Darbody. He is the CEO of the Association of University Research Parks. Previously, he was at the University of Maryland in College Park, serving in the Legal Office, Government Affairs Office, Corporate Relations and Economic Development, and Office of the President. He also served in staff roles in the U.S. House of Representatives and Maryland General Assembly, as well as with the U.S. Healthcare Financing Commission. Mr. Darmody will be speaking about U.S. research parks and innovation districts. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, great to join you from uh, College Park, Maryland. As mentioned, I'm Brian Darmody, CEO for AURP. Uh, hold on. Uh, so AURP, we are a nonprofit international NGO based in the U.S. with offices in Washington, D.C. area, College Park, Maryland, and Arizona at the University of Arizona Tech Park. So we represent research parks, innovation districts, and communities of innovation in the US, Canada, and around the world. Uh, currently, we have members in 40 states in the US, six provinces in Canada, and 13 countries. Our parks and innovation districts are sponsored by universities, some federal apps, I'll get into that, corporations and localities. Uh, and they're really place-based communities of, of innovation. So the world's first research park was started at Stanford University in 1951. You see some pictures here. Uh, there was no Silicon Valley. There were orchards around Stanford University. And this was a public-private partnership with the city of Palo Alto. You see there on the left, uh, had a groundbreaking for um, uh, the, the park. And the engineering dean, who then became president, he wanted corporations to be near uh, the university to help build those public-private partnerships. And that was oh, revolutionary geez. thought at the, uh, at the time. Sorry, because, Brian. Um, yep. Can you share your screen? I'm... Oh, I thought I am sharing. Hold on. Wait a minute. Let me get back to... Hold on one second. There we go. Can you see it now? Perfect. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. And um, I don't know why this is okay. Can you see can you see that? Yes, that looks good. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, all right. Sorry. Um so this was uh, just what I was going off of, the world's first research park at Stanford University. Um, these are just places where my association uh, has members. You can see mostly US and Canada, but some around the, uh, the world. Um, these are some of the groups. So one of the thesis of research parks is you can't do it alone. So these are just some of the groups um, AURP works with some national groups. Uh, APLU, which represents land-grant universities, BIO, um, Autumn, uh, and the Federal Lab Consortium that many of the DOE labs are probably very intimately involved with the Federal Lab uh, Consortium, and there are some other groups there. Um, we just finished our international conference uh, virtually last week. We had uh, Steve Case, uh, some of you may know, he's an entrepreneur and venture capitalist on the rise of the rest really talking about how to get more uh, financing and venture capital into areas outside of Silicon Valley and Boston. Um, and we had um, the head of bio speaking and, and a number of other speakers talking about how do you build from a policy standpoint and a practical standpoint, 
uh, communities of innovation and clusters as we heard from the earlier speaker. So this is a quote, favorite quote of mine, art is I, science is we. Uh, Claude, Claude Bernard, a famous uh, French uh, scientist. And really it, it demonstrates the idea that Nobel prizes are not given individually typically, it's team science, team uh, uh, connectivity. And, and you know, many of the DOE labs clearly uh, illustrate uh, that fact as well. Um, this is a recent report from uh, Opus Fabio, an innovation development uh, firm and um, at Southern Methodist University, George Bush Institute. And they were talking about policies on innovation. And very much they talk about investing in integrated physical spaces that connect researchers with entrepreneurs, inv investors, and other potential non-academic partners. The cluster theory that we've heard about earlier, but also um, what we've experienced in the United States and, and with AURP. So one of the other things we did uh, at my conference was we celebrated 40 years after the Bayh-Dole Act. We had Joe Allen, who was one of the help uh, on uh, Birch, Senator Birch Bayh's um, staff who helped launch the Bayh-Dole Act. And some of you may know that same year, the Stevenson Wilder Act, that was sort of like the Bayh-Dole Act for federal labs was passed. That was 40 years ago. And it's, you know, you have to think back, Apple Computer and Genentech had their first IPOs then. There are still orchards in Silicon Valley, uh, even after the Stanford Research Park was built. Kendall Square, if you know Kendall Square, a famous research park, had warehouses vacant, dec decaying re uh, warehouses next to MIT. Um, and AURP did not exist. The research park community, uh, we were started in 1986. So that idea had not matured yet. Um, but, and I will say of all the federal labs in the country, uh, DOE labs have been, had the most legal flexibility from my standpoint because most of them are managed, I think all of them are as government owned, contractor operated. And as you know, a lot of federal labs, especially at where I live in Maryland are government owned, government operated. Um, and so given that flexibility, you can see uh, places like Brookhaven have created a discovery park uh, next to it. Oak Ridge Laboratory in, in uh, cooperation with the University of Tennessee has the Cherokee Farm Research Park and Sandia Labs has the Sandia Science and Tech Park. As a matter of fact, the former director of that, Jackie Kirby Moore, was a longtime AURP board member, past president, and as some of you know, she also was the vice president for the FLC uh, until she retired uh, earlier this year. Um, and Sandia Labs has been one of our really a poster child for AURP research parks. And uh, you know, another thing that's happened both with federal labs and universities, they've tried, had strategies on how to create outposts in more um, denser areas. And uh, Sandia Labs, you know, open in downtown Albuquerque, uh, an office in conjunction with the University of New Mexico. So I think this is a, um, a, a good model of how um, even a research park sometimes is too isolating. And you can see what, in this case, Sandia Labs is doing, um, creating this uh, innovation space in conjunction with other stakeholders in, in Albuquerque. Another great model uh, that was switched to NASA is the NASA a Research Park uh, at Moffett Field. Um, this has been uh, extraordinarily successful. Um, you can see uh, proposed development and they're even bringing housing there, uh, reducing their green footprint because uh, people that live near the research park are certainly going to commute less and, and reduce um, in, uh, environmental impacts. But it also that creates the more live work play space that I think collectively all of us are looking for. And if you go to their website, it says, no, we have no space available. So you can see that uh, at least in this case, the NASA Ames Research Park has been uh, very successful. Um, and Congress is paying attention. So policymakers at the federal level are paying attention. So uh, Senator Schumer and Senator Todd Young from Indiana uh, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, have proposed the $100 billion Endless Frontiers Act um, following up uh, on the original Endless Frontier uh, report that was uh, launched by uh, 
in, after World War II that helped lay the groundwork for a lot of DOE labs and a lot of science policy and science policy uh, funding. Now this would act would give $100 billion augmentation to the National Science Foundation, but would also have a separate $10 billion set aside for creating regional clusters, regional tech hubs across the US. Um, whether this passes or not, I mean, there's some uncertainty. If there had been a Senate, a Democratic Senate, maybe it would be more likely, but it looks like uh, that won't happen. And it's not clear whether um, this particular bill would pass, but some element of this, uh, I think, is likely uh, to pass. And I wrote a blog on it. You can read about it on, on the AURP website. And the 10 areas that they would focus on are these areas. Clearly, DOE labs cover many, if not all, of these areas. Um, so that's something uh, you should be paying attention to. And even under the eligible consortia on, in the bill, federal laboratories are called out as well. Um, there is another uh, current opportunity out there that the EDA has. They're, they have a competition for $25 million for uh, grants for the Sprint Challenge. And on the left-hand side, you can see the topics, biotech, regional national government technology, access to capital, entrepreneurship support. Um, these kinds of opportunities, I hope if you are a federal lab, you're at least talking to your local state or regional economic development uh, entity because this could be a great way to partner uh, with your local um, economic development agency. Bids are due December 3rd. It's not that complicated to uh, compete and uh, if I were ADA, if I saw some involvement with the DOE lab with some kind of consortia out of my local region, that would probably be a plus factor. So make sure you look, in, look into that and connect with your local um, EDA, uh, local research economic development office. So um, as was mentioned, I was involved with, um, worked in Congress. So back when you could do earmarks, um, I was involved with setting up a $5 million earmark with the Army Research Lab. Uh, which is adjacent to the University of Maryland or nearby uh, in Adelphi, Maryland. And we had something called the Proof of Concept Alliance. And this was, a, this was funding for uh, topics and technologies that were interest to, in this case, Army Research Lab and the University of Maryland and our local economic development folks. And it was a great program. It won the FLC Mid-Atlantic Region Award. Uh, because it was an earmark, it wasn't authorized, this was kind of a one-off thing, but uh, I've always thought this was a great kind of program that uh, if we could figure out some way to fund it, it would be a useful way of getting universities and Fed labs working together. Um, always when you're thinking about why would a federal, why would a company want to work with a federal lab, uh, I think UIDP, the University Industry Demonstration Project, has some great kind of commonsensical um, principles uh, about always thinking like the client that might, the Fed Lab might want to work with. And one of the best ones is streamlining negotiations and measure, measuring results. That's clearly place-based long-term relationships between federal labs and corporations or universities. Really, you should be thinking all the time about these uh, principles. Um, the TV series Veep was filmed in Maryland and they needed a high tech looking place to look like Silicon Valley. So they planted these uh, trees, uh, which are not native to Maryland to uh, kind of simulate what Silicon Valley would look like. Um, and actually that's a building that's on the University of Maryland campus. And in that same building is a joint quantum institute, which is a partnership with NIST, University of Maryland and NSA. So NIST funded some quantum labs that were actually physically put into uh, this physical sciences building. And as a result of that, um, a company called Ion Cube spun out of the university. It's one of the leading quantum um, uh, computing institutes in the country. And that's an illustration of taking some federal lab assets, putting them outside the gates, in this case, the University of Maryland uh, campus, and building innovation for uh, out of federal uh, research. So when you think about policies to help create more uh, innovation and that flexibility I was talking about, many universities have created affiliated organizations that are not part of the university, but they're 
affiliated with the university and, and they have more flexibility to negotiate ideas. I mean, WARF is Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. Just about every public research university in the country has some kind of organization like that, as well as states have created these things. Uh, TEDCO, the Maryland Technology Development Corporation, is a state-based technology intermediary, quasi-government. Actually, I wrote the legislation for that um, uh, in the past about 25 years ago, and it's been a great asset in this case for the state of Maryland, but CIT is the uh, same kind of technology intermediary for uh, the state of Virginia. The point is these kinds of organizations are important because they are much more able to negotiate quickly um, deals between um, sometimes cumbersome organizations like public universities, sometimes federal labs, and, and the clients, whether they're uh, corporations and, and universities. So, um, I had proposed the idea of creating a national congressionally chartered uh, corporation that could take on some of the negotiating uh, difficulties that federal labs sometimes find. And this is particularly true with government owned, government operated labs, but to some extent, it may also be true for GOCO. So, I wrote a paper for the Life Science Advisory Board talking about um, ways to increase and, and treat government uh, labs more like universities. I mean, if you think about it, there's almost as much, I, actually, I think there may be more intramural research that goes on in federal labs than, than universities. I mean, the local example is NIH in Maryland, you know, which has more intramural NIH funding than, you know, Stanford, MIT, University of Washington combined, and they just won a, a Nobel Prize out of the, uh, the intramural researchers at, at NIH. So how do we get them treated more like university faculty? How do we get more kinds of assets outside the gates of NIH that you would see if NIH were a public university, there would be thousands of spin outs and things around Bethesda. But right now that doesn't exist because um, just the way they've been uh, organized since the 1940s. Um, so one idea is there's something called the Henry Jackson Foundation. This is a congressionally chartered foundation that works on health medicine for um, military. And if you look at its growth, it's been extraordinary. And one of the reasons is other entities have gone to it uh, because it is congressionally chartered. It's not part of the government, but it's, it was chartered by Congress. Um, could we create something like a Henry Jackson Foundation to do some of the tech commercialization and, and uh, university and uh, corporate uh, connections that we, we see happen with um, universities. It's an idea, I actually wrote legislation based on what the Henry Jackson Foundation statute looks like and it's in that paper that uh, I, I showed earlier about the Life Science Advisory Board. Um, so when I was president of AERP, we also wrote some other uh, ideas about taking federal labs as well as federal research in helping commercialize uh, activities. One would be create more private sector involvement near federal labs and regional uh, research cl uh, clusters. Some federal labs do not have enhanced use lease authority, meaning they can't lease excess land to the private sector. I think most DOE labs have that and most Department of Defense labs have it, but NIH doesn't have it, NIST doesn't have it, and a number of others do not have that. Um, so, we put together a, an idea of return, improving return on investment on federally funded research. Um, and I won't go in, some of this is technical about decoupling uh, property rights from tax exempt facilities. But one of them is reforming conflict of interest rules for federal researchers so that they can be more involved with public private partnerships, similar to what uh, researchers at universities are and uh, create the congressionally chartered tech technology intermediary I, I mentioned earlier. Um, so back when the Trump administration first came on uh, board, the Brookings Institution came out with 50 ideas on how to improve uh, the localization of federal R&D. And one of them was uh, task the federal labs with a local economic development mission. Um, and a number of these ideas, there were 50 of them, and I'm not, not gonna go through them, would, um, are, are worthy of, of 
interest and discussion, hopefully with the uh, Biden administration coming on board. Um, so I would urge you to take a look at these uh, uh, 50 ideas. Many of them actually could be accomplished if we did have a federal technology intermediary that could take on some of these uh, tasks. Uh, increase the importance of commercialization activities at federal labs is another uh, comment they have. And as many of you know, um, uh, NIST put out uh, a call for ideas on how to re improve the return on investment on federal uh, research. And that paper I referenced earlier, we submitted to that. Um, and NIST came out with a green paper on, in April 2019. I suspect many of you have read it or know about it. Um, some of this paper would have required implement, implementation of, of, with new statutes. So far, the Trump administration has not come out with anything. Um, I heard a rumor they may come out with some ideas in the lame duck session, if you can believe that. But um, we, will, we will see if that happens. But uh, uh, this paper is a good primer on some of the ideas that my association and I have been pushing. Um, but it does require not necessarily the federal government, uh, but Congress to act. And all of, the, uh, you know, what I've learned from trying to get federal policies is all innovation policies are local. So states like New York, which has, we're paving a lot of other labs, Maryland, Virginia, you know, Idaho, uh, California, those congressional delegations would be the ones most likely to push for additional flexibility I used to work for the federal government. I know federal government can't lobby the Congress, but that's where um, state economic development folks are important, I think, for helping create more federal lab innovation uh, policies. Um, and the other thing, before I'm just about finished, um, is I think DOE labs particularly have a chance to create public-private philanthropic partnerships, P4s, not the P3s you're talking about. Because if you think about it, uh, the work that DOE labs are doing in clean energy and environmental sustainability is of great interest to many foundations, many uh, high net worth individuals. So making sure you have a pathway so that you can get philanthropic support for DOE labs is another strategy I would recommend. I used to be uh, Associate Vice President for Corporate and Foundation Relations and you know, impact investing is something that's very important to uh, DOE, uh, to many stakeholders, and DOE labs have a lot of assets that can help address that. And, uh, and to my earlier point about involving the states, the National Governors Association talked about federal research labs back in 2017 about the importance of working with federal uh, research labs to help build more economic development. Um, I think this is my last slide. So building successful federal university industry innovation districts is a team sport. This is a picture from a, 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 a hockey game that was being televised live uh, back in the early 60s, I think. And uh, somebody had lost a new technology and that was a contact lens. But what I love about this picture is it shows everyone working together, the refs working together, both teams, even the fans in the stands. So this is a metaphor for what, uh, if we're gonna build federal university industry cooperation, uh, we really all have to work together. Um, if you're interested, uh, we look forward to working with federal labs and groups supporting federal labs. You can join AURP. Um, we're gonna have a panel on federal research parks and innovation districts at our international conference at the University of Utah in October, 2021. And uh, please get in contact me, with me if you're interested in participating or, or, or being involved with that. And with that, I have concluded my slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Very, very interesting. All right, so I'm just gonna keep us moving. Um, so next we have Ms. Julie Wagner. She is the president of the newly established Global Institute on Innovation Districts and is an expert on urban innovation ge geographies described as innovation districts. She is also president of Urban Insight, a boutique consulting practice that each year selects a few projects determined to be of particular promise in shaping cities and communities. Ms. Wagner is a non-resident senior fellow at the Met Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings. 
A trained city planner, Ms. Wagner served as deputy planning director for the District of Columbia, where she developed the city's long range plan. So Ms. Wagner will be speaking about the rise and evolution of innovation districts today. Great, welcome. Thanks so much, um, Brian. That was really helpful. I like to, I like to follow you so I can build off of some of your insights. And you're actually going to find some things that are that, that Brian emphasized, and I'm going to emphasize too. And I'll try to highlight those. So I'm going to go deep uh, for a moment, just on one model, place-based geographic model of innovation and know that I come at it with just an endless curiosity about these kinds of places called innovation districts. I simply cannot stop working because there is an endless discovery about how unique these places are. And so I come as a researcher, I come as a practitioner, and I come at it through a lens of sort of how do they grow and evolve and how to, can they be supported uh, through a whole range of different kinds of policies and programs and ambitious people and people like me to sort of say, oh, have you tried this, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think, you know, I want to walk through what it is specifically and then, and then sort of talk through some components that we have found in research um, that might be of interest to you. So I know you can see the slides and I'm going to go ahead and just put this there we go. So I'm going to talk through the innovation districts, like I said, I'm just going to move right into it in the essence of time and say, okay, what really are innovation districts and what are their unique characteristics? So 2014, Bruce Katz and I at the Brookings Institution wrote a paper called The Rise of Innovation Districts. And we were looking at all these different geographies of innovation in cities that had been moving from highly organic activities to something more intentional, more interesting to us, frankly. And so we looked at all these different ones and we realized that we had to come across to a model or a definition that was pretty simple, pretty almost pedestrian, so that it would encompass a number of these given how diverse they are. So an innovation district is a geographic area where anchor institutions, and companies cluster, right, cluster and connect with small firms, startups, business incubators, and a whole range of other actors. And there is a physical component. They're largely in physically compact areas or they are trying to get there. They're transit accessible or they're trying to get there. Uh, they have a mix of uses, housing, office, and retail, and they're all figuring out like how to strengthen that mix. So it's a, it's a really interesting kind of space because everybody's like constantly thinking about how to reinvent themselves. Uh, and so as someone that's working with a number of them, I am constantly motivated by how inspirational these people are thinking about how to move to the next level. So what are they? Like, let's just sort of walk through and show just a few examples. They're really quite diverse. So I am actually located right now in southern Switzerland. About 40 miles away from me is the Milan Innovation District. It's a 100 hectare area. It's really, it's quite small, quite compact. And the aim is to build this really intense, very uh, dense, walkable, mixed use innovation district that builds on the research strengths of these three institutions. If you go to Cortex, which is in St. Louis, their story is a, it's a beautiful story about how these regional actors, these anchor institutions said, we want to strengthen our local and regional economy. We know we're not doing well. How do we leverage our strengths? And they collectively purchased land and thought through how to creatively reimagine this land through higher density, through walkable, through accessible kinds of spaces that now is a place of over 600 companies. And then in Barcelona, the story has had a, an evolution over the, over the years, but when it really started at the beginning, it was a strong story of city leadership from the mayor, 
They reimagined this whole manufacturing area. They moved a number of the universities. They figured out a really interesting theory of change around how to create private public uh, partnerships and reimagine the public spaces. And then lastly, the Melbourne Innovation District, really strong in its own right, organically an innovation district that has evolved into something much more intentional and importantly leveraged by the University of Melbourne and RMIT, and it's a, it's a really interesting story. They're all so different. They're just uniquely strong in very different areas. They have very different elements around how they're tapping with their regional economies and, and so on. And so what Bruce and I did originally was try to find like an X-ray. Like how do we X-ray these places that are so different? And so our simple X-ray, right, is really looking at sort of these kinds of circles and then and balancing these circles because that's what they're all trying to do, a balance of the physical and the economic and the networking. So on the economic, which is a lot of the, the innovation actors and other economic actors, it is about your institutions. It can be around even small batch manufacturing. It can be you know, digitally based companies that are like strong in AI and computing. And they're all clustering you know, in different parts of the district for one reason or another. Uh, then you find that there's a whole series of physical characteristics that really make them unique and that they're embracing some aspects of the city, you know, more around the proximity where it's easy to access by walking and where there's sort of an agglomeration effect. And it has a whole mix of things, right? Every place is really different in terms of the kinds of moves of physical investments they make, but some things that stand out include so at the bottom it's you know these sort of more public accessible spaces where like and unlike people can come together and this is a really iconic um, example which is uh, one that i use often transit in terms of increasing the connectivity and accessibility many of these districts have it many others are fighting for it and then the up above which is the innovation infrastructure so it's an innovation district so the innovation infrastructure, the labs, the facilities, the prototyping facilities, those things are essential and they undergird this type of, of district. And it's one of the pieces that give these districts a unique value proposition. And then lastly, this, the networking piece, the social networking piece, which is often missed, but importantly defines and can actually be a defining factor on why certain people, why certain types of talent, and even why companies may be wanting to go to one place over another. And it's about the kinds of ways that people can connect with people. So I have a series of innovation districts, some that have been at it for about 15 years, and I, I, they would argue that this is where they want and need to be spending a large part of their time because it is making, making those connections. And now even with COVID, those connections are happening online. They're not much easier to continue given how strong those networks are. So those are sort of the, the X way, right? The sort of broad level view you know, as we go deeper and, you know, Bruce and I wrote this paper in 2014, but we started our research back in 2008. So the research over time has sort of added layers of additional insights, additional detail that we know really matters in defining and positioning these districts. And importantly, and it speaks to what the two, two speakers have said before me, which is, you know, importantly, leveraging local and regional strengths and advantages, and at the same time, being nimble and open and willing to seek new opportunities. It's really these sort of two things that I often find happening at the same time. So what I'm gonna just quickly do is walk through just a few slides on what we mean by strengthening these unique specializations and the research that we just recently did on innovation districts in the last nine months. 
So because we're the Global Institute um, and the Brookings Institution is one of our partners, we set out to understand, let's look across a range of different regions. So let's look in this case, let's look in Europe, let's look in Israel, let's look in the United States. In fact, there's four districts that we looked at in the United States. Let's look at Australia. And then let's also look at a district in South America, which is in Medellin, Colombia. Very different unique specializations, very different sizes of land, very different kinds of intentions. And yet we started to look at them through similar lenses to understand how different are they? How similar are they? So here's one example of where we looked at peer review articles. And if you just look at the upper right hand quadrant, sort of above this axis, and that's where there's sort of a higher concentration of articles and then a higher concentration of high impact articles. And it tells us, for instance, just this one indicator, and we looked at a whole range of how Medellin and how Medesheva has a, you know, a range of these different kinds of subfields that there, there's a lot of different smaller things going on and could be a really strong story of convergence. And this is what Chris Fall was talking about at the beginning, the sort of story about the melding of different sectors and disciplines coming together as a means to innovate. Well, actually, that's their story. This is, in fact, what they're focusing on and figuring out how to fuel convergence. If you look at Melbourne and the Pittsburgh Innovation District, their story, wow, you really see some strong strengths in biomedical and health sciences. And actually, they really are quite off the charts. It's no surprise that they're actively involved in the COVID vaccine, that they're playing a fundamental role in providing both basic research and applied research in those areas. And they're certainly getting a lot of attention and they're getting additional funding for that. But they have other areas that they're looking at. There's some in engineering, some in robotics. And so they too are looking at convergence. But this story, this strength that they have in these districts is something that you just simply cannot ignore. And it's something that they're going to want to build on. So another thing that we looked at is sort of not just on the university side, but also on the knowledge sector side, like the knowledge intensive jobs and here's, here's Medellin, right? So Medellin, for us, had a surprising number of knowledge-intensive industries clustered around the universities. And they had a strong focus in math, computer science, and physical science and engineering. And then we laid it out physically. Like, where are they spatially in the district? And then we laid all of the districts out. We laid them out. We looked at all of them. And then we had a whole series of interviews to understand what's going on. And there really is different theories about how to grow hyper-local innovation clusters. I mean, it's just, it's fascinating how uniquely ambitious these different actors are and what, how it manifests on the ground. I could spend an hour on this and I promise you I won't, but it's, it's, there's just a lot of interesting theories out there. And I, and I think these two probably spell out a very unique and diverse set of stories. One, which is looking at how to cluster across different blocks and another, which is on the right, thinking about how do you strengthen within one building and having a lot of programming within one building and have it connect to another. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So I want to just move on in the essence of time to a few other slides, just because the emphasis around quality and connected places, we also looked at that. So many slides on that. I only just took, I think, one or two. So one thing that we found is how fascinating and how powerful it is for innovation districts even at the building level have integrated places. So to not have one actor, but to have a mix. So in Winston-Salem, that university now has, as its own practice, a designed intention to have integrated spaces between the university, between corporates, between 
smaller companies, between retail, between amenities, and to make it really mixed and really active. And so, you know, they're kind of setting a new bar for how universities, frankly, should be thinking about creating these kind of vibrant places. Another thing that we looked at is how these geographies are trying to create centers of gravity, right? You have a generally a large geographic area. So you have, let's say, cortex that's 200 acres. So if you want to get a feeling of a buzz, of a, a set of activities, how are you doing this in such a large space? Well, they're doing it in a way where different districts are saying, you know what, we're going to focus on a few places and really magnify what we can do there and make all these things happen there. So people are going there for different reasons and then they start to connect and collide. So it's like social engineering at a whole new level. And it's just simply fascinating that all of them, these are places that are not normally working together, that they're applying throughout their own learning experimentation applying some really interesting and similar principles. And then lastly, on the, on the place-based side, finding fundamental power in what we're calling porosity. So those ground floor spaces that are opened up and that are inviting and people can stay, and you don't have to have a key card and there's a mix and a diversity. So we started to analyze like, okay, who has this kind of porosity and what kinds of activities are happening? So this is something that we're looking at as researchers and saying, ah, this is something very interesting. You know, how can districts take this and scale it in a way that actually makes sense? All right, so last, just a few couple of slides with respect to how we've been seeing districts evolving. And I honestly could take a, some of those last some of those last slides and actually say actually they're also evolving in these ways. But I want to take a few others. And Brian, this sort of speaks to one of your points that you made, which is the power of intermediaries. I, I could not agree more. The power of intermediaries are these sort of separate actors on the ground that are in there to help advance the local ecosystem. They are, they make connections. They're these natural handholders. And these districts are finding a power by not just having one type, but multiple types and having them in different parts of the district. And some are making sure they're connected and others haven't reached that point yet. But it's a really interesting layer through which you can look at these geographies of innovation to understand what's happening with the ecosystem. If I was to look at how innovation districts are evolving, and it's, it speaks to the point of this session today, it is about the integration of government facilities with R&D activities. Many districts don't have those, there's a growing number that are starting to have those. So in Beersheba in Israel, this is a project that I've worked closely on and worked with the Israeli Defense Force on their digital campus, which is part of the innovation district. And so the national government has been very focused on how to be supportive of a broader innovation district effort. And what does that mean? So what it means is A, what could be a way to facilitate joint R&D? An intermediary. So there's a conversation now about could there be an intermediary that creates that kind of facilitated support between the IDF, the university, which is very strong in cyber and engineering, and industry, which includes IBM and Dell and others that are there, and help support a growing set of startups. That's the conversation that's happening, uh, and it's one to watch. And so then there's that physical implication, right? So how do you then create a space where an intermediary actually is the physical center, and then you create a set of integrated spaces around it? This is also the conversation, and using this as a unique center of gravity.
So this is sort of how these kinds of places are starting to think about evolving, including how they're organizing and how their governance is being established. And so my analysis, I looked at, you know, how, what kind of models they have. So some actually have not-for-profit models, some have government-led models, some have like regional private partner, partnerships, and then the Beersheba model, which is yet to be developed, is likely going to have a model where the government is part of this narrative somehow. That's what they're working on right now, and so we'll see as government facilities and organizations and entities start to become more integrated into this, what does that mean for governance and like the role that they have in a board talking about where and how to diversify and where to focus on the physical realm and where to put programs. I think it's a really interesting way of building that kind of collaborative partnership that, that Brian, you were talking about with that image at the end. So lastly, I think, you know, one of the things that I've been watching about how these district leaders have been like nimbly, like pulling as many levers as they can to get as strong as they can, they're kind of moving beyond the sort of the classic definition of what these kinds of assets can be doing to build and grow and prosper. So if you take number one, unique specializations and you say, okay, how are we becoming much more strong and robust in our R&D and innovation potential? You really think this is like an, just an economic story. It's not, it, it actually is about leveraging the right kinds of physical assets, that innovation infrastructure. How do you open up the labs? How do you create those kind of opportunities that make it much more sticky? and magnetic for, for industry, for startups, and same for networking assets. Fundamental roles. Fundamental role in advancing unique specializations. Let's take quality of place. You think it would just be physical activities, you know, in the public realm. Wrong. Companies, institutions, government facilities, fundamental role. Every single building has an important role to play to be how do you put, become part of the physical ecosystem? And how do you have networking in public spaces that transcend walls, that transcend where, like who owns what? These types of things are what these district leaders and their actors are thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. And frankly, you know, I, I just, I'm learning every day more and more about these sort of interesting insights. So here's my last slide. Okay, so the, the story of Cortex, which I started out with at the beginning, which is, you know, in here there's these anchor institutions that are wanting to build a, a, a local and regional economy. Well, this is what actually on a timeline their story looked like. Okay, so from 1998 to 2018. And so from 1998, you can see they actually didn't have that many jobs in there, many companies. And then all the way between that time to around 2013, you kind of could say, mm, I don't know if they were really doing a very good job, right? Like they, that's just sort of what you would see looking at this with the naked eye. But actually, when you see this hockey stick effect where they made this significant work, Right, moving from zero to 600 companies, from basically zero employees to 6,000 jobs, and now creating pre-COVID 2.1 billion US dollars into the local and regional economy, they were up to something. And what they were up to was how to organize for success. It's about the governance, how power is shared, how to get staff to be working on this day in, day out, how to have a physical plan that ties places together, how to have a web of intermediaries, how to create the kinds of incentives, including the incentives, Brian, that you were talking about. I think they were wonderful. And I think, so there's just a lot under these places and these spaces that go into orchestrating the kinds of ecosystems that we talk about and often talk about so lightly. 
So I think this is a phenomenal kind of geography of innovation, very experimental, not afraid of failing, trying, adapting. Uh, and I just think that, you know, the role of government and the role of facilities and sort of playing a contributing role to that, it's just one that I, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch and I look forward to, to observing and researching it. I end. That is my conclusion. Thank you so much, Julie. And I have a lot of questions coming in, but we have two more speakers and um, hopefully we will have enough time for questions at the end. Uh, so next we're going to go to Dr. Jonathan Gruber. He's the Ford Professor of Economics at MIT, where he's taught since 1992. He's also the former director of the healthcare program at the National Bureau of Economic Research and the former president of the American Society of Health Ec Economists. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Social Insurance and the Econometric Society. He has published more than 180 research articles, has edited six research volumes, and is the author of Public Finance and Public Policy, a leading undergraduate text, and Healthcare Reform, a graphic novel. Dr. Gruber will be speaking about his latest book, co-authored with Dr. Simon Johnson called Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. And over to you. Oh, Jonathan, I think you're still on mute. Looks like he may have fallen off as a panelist. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Great. Sorry about that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, well, uh, it's hard to have technical glitches in a meeting about about technical uh, technical agglomeration. So I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, as Susanna mentioned, uh, I'm uh, going to focus today on a recent book that I wrote with Simon Johnson, my colleague at MIT, and it's called Jumpstarting America. And really, the book has kind of three parts. The first part is sort of the history of how public R&D made America great. Uh, I don't think I need to convince this crowd of that. Uh, I think I'll just remind you of a number that's not often remembered, which is that in 1965, the US government spent 2% or the US spent 2% of our entire GDP on public research and development. That is one in every $50 in America went to publicly funded science. Today that's down to 0.6% of GDP. We've gone from being multiples of the next best country in the world to 12th in the world in terms of public R&D. And that has had a dramatic cost in terms of the productivity of the US economy. It's had dramatic costs in terms of creating good jobs. It's had a dramatic cost in terms of our overall living standards. And so it's very important to recognize that the public sector has a key role in promoting research and development. And that the public sector in doing so doesn't displace the private sector, but actually complements the private sector. So for example, every dollar in NIH funding leads to $8 in private R&D funding, uh, private biopharma funding. So basically, there is a role the government has in increasing economic growth and creating jobs. By the estimates in our book, if we simply raised the amount of R&D we do in America by half a percent of GDP, which would, not, which would not go anywhere near to our peak, but would bring us back into the top two or three in the world. We estimate that would create 4 million jobs. So there are jobs to be made, there's economic growth to be had by major investments in public R&D. But the point of this call is not to convince you we need public R&D. I think people on this call are convinced. The point is to talk about 
the place-based aspect of that aspect of that. And that's another part of our book, which is recognizing the enormous failures of both the private and public R&D infrastructure in the US to spread its benefits around the country. You could see that in a number of ways. One way to see it is the recent Brookings report, which suggested that 90% of the growth and innovation jobs in the US over the past 12 years has been in only in less than 10 cities. You could see in the distribution of venture capital in the US, where 75% of venture capital is in five cities. You can even see the distribution of federal grant making, where the vast majority of grant making goes to a number of top coastal states. So basically what we've done is we've sort of really concentrated our research funding in a small set of what we call superstar cities. Now, that's not necessarily a problem, okay? What we've got as a situation in the world today is a strong effect of what economists call agglomeration economies. The notion of the knowledge economy, essentially the more intense is the buildup of knowledge in an area, the higher rate of return to incremental investments in that area. That basically since we all feed off each other in terms of developing new ideas, the more crowded areas are with people implementing new ideas, the more new ideas will emerge. And that makes a lot of sense. And th so there's nothing inherently wrong with the notion that a set of errors will emerge as technology leaders. It's sort of natural. The problem arises when those areas won't grow. And what I mean by that is when those areas don't have policies that allow them to grow in an affordable way when they have policies that cause barriers to building new housing and lead to things like still existing small single family multi-million dollar housing in Silicon Valley or zoning laws in the Boston area that don't let you build buildings very tall. As a result, you have a small set of areas which are dominating in innovation growth, but they themselves can't grow physically, partly geographically. I mean, Boston is only one direction, you know, that you lose an entire half of the circle there in Boston. But even in general, you've got a situation where there are housing restrictions which don't allow these places to grow. And as a result, you have a situation where the superstar cities of the innovation hubs in America are unaffordable for most Americans. In 1980, the top 10 highest earning cities in America, only three of them were on the coast, seven were in the, in the middle of the country. And the average house price in the top 10 highest earning cities in America was 25% higher than all other cities. Today, nine of the 10 highest earning cities in America are on the coast. And the average house price is 300% of the average in other cities, not the whole country, forgetting rural areas, just literally compared to other cities. It costs three times as much to live in a coastal superstar city as it does in the average city in the US. As a result, we have a situation where growth is being choked because the innovation is happening in a small set of places and they're not growing to accommodate the number of people who'd like to move there. You even see labor mobility massively down in the US because people can't afford to move where the good jobs are because the good jobs come with unaffordable housing prices. And that's why we argue in the book, you need a new jump start, And you need to recognize that it doesn't have to be this way. That there are many, many places in America that can be next generation technology hubs. So to, to, to look at this, we went to the data. We found places that were well-educated, at least 25% of residents went to college and they had leaning universities, that were large, at least 100,000 working age population, so that you were large enough to possibly become a new technology hub, and that had uh, affordable housing, an average house price less than the national average of about $220,000. What we found, I'm just gonna share my screen for a second, and show you a map of what we found. Uh, here you go. This is a map of what we found. 102 places all around our country, which are highly educated, have excellent universities, are large enough to become tech hubs, and have very affordable housing. Places like Rochester, New York, where the average house price is $170,000, they have fantastic universities and a highly educated population, but placed all over the country, granted mostly to the Mississippi, but a number west of the Mississippi. 
And all over the country, we have places that can become the next generation technology hubs, but they can't do it on their own. They need a jump start because right now the problem is the venture capital's not there, the research funding isn't there. If we're going to create next generation technology hubs, we're going to have to give them a jump start. Okay? So the question is, how do we do that? Well, I'm going to start by asking everyone in this call a question. Okay, now you can't answer me. Uh, you, you can't answer, you know, maybe people can put in the chat or something if they get it right. But I'll ask you a question. Now, to be fair, I've asked this question to about uh, 2,300 people and 17 have gotten it right. So this is a hard question, so don't feel bad if you get it wrong. My question is, what city in America is the home of the computer simulation industry? It's the center of the computer simulation industry, even hosting the annual conference, and the largest university by enrollment in, in, in America. Largest or second largest, it bounces back and forth. Home of the computer simulation industry, largest university by enrollment. I don't know how many of you guessed Orlando, Florida, but that is the answer. Why Orlando, Florida? Because in 1956, the editor of the Orlando Sentinel endorsed a little known politician named Lyndon Johnson for president. He did so again in 1960. In 1964, after re-election, Johnson called him up and said, you've been very good to me, what do you want for Orlando? And he said, I want a Navy base. Now, did Lyndon Johnson let the fact Orlando was landlocked stop him? No, he gave Orlando a landlocked Navy base. Okay, what do you do at a landlocked Navy base? You train. So it became a training center for the Navy, including a small unit that had formed on Long Island, which was a battle simulation unit, which moved to Orlando. Fast forward to 1978, a mid-sized, fairly, quite frankly, mediocre university called the University of Central Florida has a very innovative president who sees land is cheap and goes to the Navy and says, look, I propose that I buy a thousand acres, that, that we together create a corporation that get, gets a thousand acres below the University of Central Florida to create a research park and to, to kick it off, you move your now, your simulation unit, which is now doing nascent computer simulation, you move that below the university and make that the center of our research park. The Navy agreed. And today, the Central Florida Research Park, which is 45 minutes from Disney, okay, the Central Florida Research Park has 10,000 employees. And East Orange County, once again, no, nowhere near Disney, has added 100,000 jobs in 30 years. That's a jump start that comes from federal investment, a federal commitment to massive R&D. But that's a jump start that has gone beyond the federal government. Most of the jobs in the Central Florida Research Park are now not government funded. And meanwhile, the University of Central Florida is now a, the largest university by enrollment in the country and is the number 10 engineering department, electrical engineering department in the country. This can happen all over the country, but it's not gonna happen organically. It's gotta happen with government commitment to creating new technology hubs. And I'm thrilled to see that that has become the focus of recent legislation in Congress. From the Endless Frontiers Act, which was mentioned, which puts $10 billion in creating new technology hubs, to the Coons-Durbin legislation, which puts $80, million, $80 billion in creating technology hubs, to the recently unveiled um, uh, act by, uh, uh, piece of legislation by, by Ro Khanna, the 21st Century Jobs Act, which would put $900 billion over a decade into new R&D and focus a, a substantial share of it in techno new technology, up to 30 new technology hubs around the country. In our book, we lay out how this could be done. Because the trick here, of course, is you worry, and those of us who are students of political economy worry, well, gee, anytime you have a place-based policy like that, it'll just become ugly politics. And who's ever most, pop who's ever most powerful, who's ever chair of the Appropriations Committee will get all the money for their city. So that's why it's important to set it up in an objective way, okay, and to follow Amazon's lead. What did Amazon do when they wanted to pick headquarters? They had a competition. They said, we want a new HQ2. They gave cities six weeks to respond and 230 cities around the country responded with plans, okay? But the Amazon competition was what we call a race to the bottom. Amazon competed by seeing who could give them the biggest tax break. Let's create a race to the top, a competition where places bid to become new technology hubs. And let's make it apolitical by following the lead of another government example, which is what happened when the government had to face 
the most difficult, one of the most difficult challenges it faced in the post-World War II period, which was closing military bases. Closing military bases is really hard because local politicians really don't want them to close, their job creators, etc. So what did the government do? It set up a nonpartisan base closing commission, which was successful in closing hundreds of bases around the country. We can have a technology opening commission, technology hub opening commission on the same apolitical principles and put the money into it to make sure that we can jumpstart new technology hubs around the country. We are really pleased that these kind of ideas are being reflected in federal legislation. We're really pleased, and, and let's come back to the sort of organizers call, let's come back to DOE and let's come back to the national labs. The national labs can become a key part of this plan. So for example, one of the, one of the places, the natural place for technology hub is Knoxville, Tennessee, right near the uh, Oak Ridge Laboratory. They could work together to become, and this comes to what was mentioned before about allowing the land around national labs to be developed by private entities. It's time to work constructively to put together private government and university partnerships to create these technology, these technology hubs. And I think the national labs can play a really central role in being part of that movement. Uh, so I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan, that was great. All right, moving to our last speaker, uh, Wendy. And she is the Open Campus Manager at the Army Research Laboratory. Uh, ARL's Open Campus was launched in 2014 with the goal of bringing together government laboratories, academic institutions, and the private sector to form a global collaborative network to address tough Army challenges. And let's see if her slides are working. If not, we can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. So I think I shared my screen. Is that correct? Correct. We can see it. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so I can't see that I'm sharing my screen. So hopefully that'll work out just fine. And I can't hear your questions. So just type them in the chat if that's the case. So it's interesting, I, I wanna thank all the speakers that went in front of me. I think that it's interesting to be the cleanup suite, you know, speaker, if you would. Um, what I would say is, is that um, <clears throat> this is kind of a, you've gotten lots of examples on how clusters are good, on how innovation districts can bring about economy and outcomes and about the importance of the ecosystem and networking. And so this to me is almost a case study. So are my slides moving along? Yes? Yes, they're moving. So here, just so you know where we are, um, I'm from the Army Research Laboratory. We see ourselves as the Army's corporate laboratory. And so our job is to operationalize science for transformational overmatch. And because we're the basic laboratory for the Army. We work across a diverse number of areas except for true medical research. And so you see we have um, programs in ballistics to network and information sciences, to propulsion, to protection, because again, a, a soldier's job is to move, shoot, and communicate. So giving, just showing that we have a very broad technical program. So what was realized in 2014 is, is that there was many barriers to working with the Army. Um, in many cases, it started with a fence. Um, we're not the land property owners, but to enter into any Army base, you have to come you know, and have the right credentials to come through a gate that has a guard on it, um, usually a gun on his hip. So we're kind of intimidating to work with. We don't necessarily you know, make it easy to work for us, with us. And so what we had to do is look at across the board at reducing the barriers to be able to collaborate. And what Open Campus is really about is partnership. And so it's really building a, an environment that brings people together to work together. So what does that mean? So the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about how we kind of reduce the paperwork. How do we make it easier? We, op we physically opened areas within our laboratory especially at the Adelphi Laboratory Center, where people could come work inside our laboratory side by side in our facilities. We also made it so that our researchers were encouraged to go out to sit at universities and industry to work with other partners as well. 
We worked um, to develop virtual research centers. And again, we wanted to look at the, the path for hiring later on to make sure that there were students and scientists in the future to hire, but also to work at our partners. Um, we explored and implemented a hubs and spokes model. We looked at enhanced use lease about actually using some of the underutilized land within our campuses to be able to bring our partners to sit with us. But again, a lot of things happened here. Um, some of those are related to people. Um, we changed our policies with regard to flexible workplaces and schedules. If your partner is in Australia and you had to work from eight to four, it's awfully hard to collaborate, you know, spend some time together, whether it was virtually or otherwise with your partner there. Um, we, we have great use of things like direct hire authority, which enables us to do very rapid hiring of some top talent. So we weren't losing out on good people. We made revisions to sabbatical policies. We developed an entrepreneurial separation program. And so, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship are things that we're focusing on now. So what you wanted it to do is if somebody developed great IP, you wanted them just like with a academic model to be able to go do a spin-off company and let them go try to be the next big thing. And it gave them some protections on if they needed to come back into our environment. So <clears throat> to be able to have a open campus, it's not that ARL doesn't have restricted missions because we do. There are some things that we're not going to necessarily collaborate with someone. So some of the big rules are is you had to figure up a, a way to open up a campus. And so we still have a layered security. So, you know, you still have to come in through the gate and you have to, you know, have some verification. And then what we did do is open up areas that included the auditorium, some conference rooms, some key laboratories, um, the bank, the gym, um, areas where that, uh, that our partners could sit, including foreign national researchers that could be part of our, our ecosystem and actually work elbow to elbow with other researchers. So again, we looked at ways to be able to make sure that we imp implemented you know, the security systems within our facilities to make sure that we were able to do that. As a result of some of those investments, we actually had some secondary benefits. Um, it helps us with, so what actually somebody who is in our network actually wears a, a badge holder that tracks them throughout the building so we know where they are. But we can also that, do that to property and so we can help track property. Um, and it allows for some other things if we have active shooters and some other stuff, we can lock down parts of the building. But again, we made a great big investment in infrastructure. So in addition to physical spaces, we've also made investments into our networks because we had to make sure that we could do data sharing and communication. And so we went from a, you know, a wired system, wired networks to wireless and then different access points for different kinds of visitors. ARL's role is the face to the academic community. And so um, you've gotten pieces of that through everybody else's talk, but what you have is, is about 80% um, of the DOD laboratories are east of the Mississippi. ARL is headquartered um, out of the Adelphi Laboratory Center. And then we also have a key contingency in the same state at Aberdeen Proving Ground. And so not everybody wants to move to Maryland, as wonderful as Maryland is and our home of the blue crabs and, and that sort of stuff. People want to live where they want to live, where their families are. And so what we look to do is expand our network. And so not everybody was going to come and work into our areas, but we also opened up remote sites with regional leads in California in Texas, in Illinois, in Boston. And so again, those were places with great universities with some already thriving venture capitalists with some good thriving um, research center areas. And so again, we've expanded our footprint by putting our folks out within universities and with other innovation hubs. So what we're trying to do is what I would say is, is these partnerships are a research multiplier because again, through Open Campus, you heard mention that there's not a lot of money in R&D anymore. And so what we are is trying to look at research multipliers. And so 
How do we fill those gaps between programs that aren't going to be completed with Army funds? And so can we build programs with our partners to be able to do that? Uh, one of the other things that we've done is, is that we've used partner intermediaries to help find us the right partners. So again, you can see that we're starting to have much more of a national model. And then we're also reaching internationally as well. Our offices have folks located in Tokyo and then also with um, London, and we have a vacancy right now in Brazil, but again, doing an international model as well. <clears throat> There's a lot of tools in the toolbox for the federal government on how we can do collaboration. And so again, there's things like the cooperative research and development agreements. Um, there are patent licensing, there's MOUs and MOAs and data exchanges. So what I'd like to say is there's lots of tools in the toolbox. And really what's important about that is that means that we can exchange staff, we can leverage facilities, we can share data and it protects intellectual property. So again, the tools are there to be able to collaborate with a variety of different partners. And so what I'm really saying is, is that there's a willingness on the behalf of the Army Research Lab to work together collaboratively to answer the hard Army problems. Again, in the right-hand corner of this one talks about a master CRADA and a joint work statement. So that was another way that we just tried to reduce the amount of bureaucracy so we used to, before Open Campus started, we had about a dozen CRADAs, Cooperative Research and Development Agreements to work with other people. And now we have over 200 projects, um, lots of partners, but we have a master CRADA, so the, the terms are, are pretty well defined. And then each of the, the joint work statements fall under that, which um, talk about the specific technical effort. Um, so Open Campus is really about expanding the S&T research ecosystem. So it's working with academia, working with industry, um, working with senior Army leadership, but also access to the Army Research Labs ecosystem also gives you other access to other, our partners as well. Because again, part of that is, is what are the Army problems? And, you know, what are they? How do you get soldiers? What do they care about? And so again, very Army specific challenges that are important to all. And you can see that there's been benefit of our collaboration model here of building this ecosystem because there's a benefit to the Army because there's been a leverage of in-kind research. Um, there's lots of partnerships and you can see that there's been exchanges of people as well. So um, just as a note, when we're going forward to create our open campus, one of the things that we did is, is we leveraged authorities that were new and coming out. And so this helped us with hiring staff and shaping the workforce, um, making sure that we had investments in top facilities. So one of the things about open campus is when you're working with a partner, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, you build the next best you know, new laboratory on your own campus. It could be an investment in your partner's um, area instead. Um, whether University of Maryland is one of our partners, um, since it's co-located by the Army Research Lab's headquarter. But again, we could put it on their research district. So we actually look at that analysis now to see where that investment makes place. Do we put it at a partner's place? Does it go into academia? academia? So that justice has much more value in the investment from the army of what you're doing. We don't need to build more of the same. We, what we need to do is, is really what they call state of the art and unique. And so a lot of people throw those adjectives on things, but you know, let's really make sure we know where the investments are in our ecosystem. So another important thing I would just wanna mention about um, open campus is, is really there's a value proposition. And so in certain cases, there's a benefit to all the partners that participate. Sometimes they're tangible payoffs and sometimes they're intangible, but they don't have to be the same for, the, for ARL as it does for the partner. Um, for ARL, it gives us the ability, you know, to attract new people, you know, to have future people to hire. But for the partner, it could actually be the understanding of the government challenges. It could have, you know, ARL researchers that, you know, teach in their environment. It can have 
like one of the, we have a big industry partner. And so in one case, we, we sent our, our researcher to their environment for a year and built a lot of different um, new programs as a result. They then sent a researcher to our environment. In addition to the technical researcher that that person was doing, they helped form five additional partnerships as a result of that as being a liaison. Because again, the, the thought of an ecosystem really has to do with that value of people working together. And again, there's a lot of advantages to be able to do things like that. So I've kind of rushed through my presentation because I know we have less than five minutes, but some of the key takeaways is, is I think that it's important to look at the tools that already exist for, you know, that facilitate innovation. I think um, one of the things we have to look at is, is building partnerships. So you have to find the right partners. You do the analysis and the, you know, use your business analytic tools for us. We also leverage our partnership intermediaries. Then you work really hard to reduce, you know, you have to be a good partner to have good partners. And so reduce those barriers and establish a very solid relationship. You know, make sure that you're partnered wherever you are and wherever you're located with your state and local government systems. And again, remember that the value of each partnership within the ecosystem doesn't have to be the same benefit to all partners, but it just has to be beneficial. And so I think on that, um, let me double check. Yep, and so, and again, make sure that you make yourself available for partnerships. Again, one of the things that we did for open campuses is that we, you know, before you ran into a government researcher at a conference or you cited their paper, we now have a website that actually has the opportunities where people are looking to do research. So it's a pull push model now. We've held things like open campus, open houses where people can come and tour facilities and meet people. So again, I think it's about being out there. So again, it's been a, a great opportunity to talk about where we're gonna take our innovation. And you know, for geography, I think it needs to be distributed models with very good partners. And so, you know, in one way, I've heard much of what the former speakers said in front of me, and just to say that I believe we're trying to implement some of those models in the Army. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, so uh, if you didn't see the chat, um, a few of our speakers can stay for about 15 minutes, so we, we will still have a QA. and a um, Hopefully people can stick around. I'm just going to quickly um, go back to Chris to see if he had any questions or thoughts he wanted to share. Hopefully he is still there. Okay, well then I, um, if he comes back, then we will um, give him an opportunity to say a few words, but I just wanted to thank all of our panelists and, and speakers. Um, this I thought this was such an interesting conversation and I'm really glad that you could participate. So I'm a few questions have come through the chat um, and I'm going to, there have been a few questions about the idea of you know, looking at clusters or innovation districts. Many of the examples that were presented were in urban areas do you um, think that this is a concept that could translate to uh, some of the more rural areas that our national labs are located in? Oh, sorry. Chris is back. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> Unfortunately, I have, to, I have to get on to another meeting, but this has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. The presentations were phenomenal and uh, um, really a lot to think about. So, so thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sorry. Brief comment. Brief. Sorry. <laughs> you were fantastic. Oh, um, a lot Does of our have... members are, you know, land grant universities, right? So they're in pretty rural areas like the University of Illinois, Nebraska. Uh, and others. Um, and obviously they are large research institutions, so they're able to, um, you know, compete uh, and sort of leverage their resources. But we also have members like community colleges. So um, there they're not doing research, but they're doing uh, technician training, for example. That's one 
way of community engagement because um, oftentimes, whether you're in rural or urban areas, you know, how do you get the community engaged? And all of the community doesn't need a PhD. And I think something like 40% of the jobs in most research parks, you know, an associate's degree is, is, is sufficient. So it is thinking like workforce and how do you get um, the community engaged? But there has to be some reason for the community to be engaged. I mean, many research parks failed in the 80s, 70s, and 80s because they found land and they said, this is our research park. But it, there was no reason for the park to be there. It was, you know, 30 miles from the university. So you just can't, you need to have more than just the name research park or innovation district. Julie, I don't know if you agree with me, you really need to, to be strategic yeah, yeah. about it. No, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, one of the parts that I had talked about and sort of some of the key attributes of an innovation district really is physical proximity and agglomeration effect. You know, um, and, and, and that actually means some degree of density that allows for that. And you can create that, right, in a, in a more of a suburban, urbanizing area, more challenging in a rural area. You know, I, I grew up in Vermont. I keep thinking about like, where could I honestly, if I wanted to create one, where would I do this and sort of think through <laughs> you know, what's the right place. And you know, one obvious thing is you have to think about what are the R&D strengths that you first build from. So some of the districts that I showed, you, you're building from something that's there. Others are moving them in, literally unanchoring the anchors, and then you're creating this agglomeration effect. So, you know, the story then, if you're starting from something very at a low base, your timeline goes like, significantly longer. So these are the kinds of factors that you want to be thinking about. And then also just sort of realistically, is that the right model given where I am and what I have? And, and that's just taking, having some robust analysis that I, I just believe is fundamental for all these places. I will probably also join up on that. This is, uh, um, in the Basque country, this is really great example of the rural cases because um, everybody knows, I think, Bilbao, uh, which is like a big industrial city. And uh, I liked actually, you, Julie, your comparison of how the transformation took place also in uh, Barcelona that you mentioned is one of the innovation districts, right? Um, in Bilbao, they have also very nice pictures of like 90s, everything completely uh, port based, hard industry. And now you have all these fancy new buildings and open spaces. And um, uh, this is where you can actually also find uh, in a couple of technology centers. Um, Technalia, uh, maybe some of the well, uh, experts in, um, in um, a forefront uh, science know Technalia or ICA4, they're regionally. But uh, Technale has like uh, globally representative offices all over the world. And uh, those centers are explicitly actually located not in the urban areas, but in rural areas uh, and trying to attract uh, the labor force. And this is the hardest part because who wants indeed live in the rural areas? So they um, artificially create in the space, but I guess they're lucky they have really nice uh, nature and landscape. They're located on the coastline. So, and lots of also traditional institutions that have been um, involved in that area, uh, they tend not to be that global. So they're really localized. So they like to stay in, you know, within their communities, which plays on the advantage of that. But it's indeed uh, a question of how to create uh, rural areas attractive for innovation. And um, yeah, I, um, I don't remember now the source, but the European Commission is doing a lot of studies recently for how to promote innovation in rural areas. So um, I can look up to that uh, if needed because this is a really hot topic nowadays uh, uh, in lots of areas. Um, <clears throat> so there also uh, a question given today's environment about COVID. Um, so when we're thinking about the post COVID work environment where physical location can be a risk that has to be mitigated. What is the role of an opportunity for distance engagement when we're thinking about clusters or, or um, maximizing innovation? So can I just sort of take a, a, a task, a stab at that? Because 
So we have a, a network right now of innovation districts and we actually in part pulled them together given COVID and really wanted to use this as an opportunity. And then we had a whole series of listening sessions about COVID and what does this mean? Because innovation districts, right, are building on physical proximity, face-to-face -face communication, all these like attributes that have been, you know, valued and right now, there's, you know, shunned questions about what can we really do. So here's what a lot of the innovation districts are thinking about that, I, that I'm engaged with. Uh, a, you know, they do see very much the importance of still having their, their networks and their workers and their researchers still connected given the complexity of the information and the need to use, for example, wet labs. So there is still very much a need for many to be both either connected to physical infrastructure or connected to each other. So it's required them right now to innovate alone. One is taking as much as possible online and the stronger the networks have been prior to COVID, the easier the online activity has been. And then to be shifting the ones where they need to be in the facilities to be actually providing now a set of supports where people can move in and out of the space in a safe way. The conversations now are shifting to what happens when we start to have a greater understanding about how we can either, you know, either through technology or have through a vaccine or better understanding of mitigation? Is there, are there hybrid approaches where people can start to increasingly come back through creative measures? So for, for what I'm seeing, it's sort of pushing on a number of leaders to be thinking creatively about the role of place and safety and people and, and to basically nimbly adapt over time with the aim, right, of ultimately once we can come back together to be sort of fueling the flame of what people really want, which is this social connectivity. So it's, it's a really interesting time to see how people are thinking about this and running past ideas. Have you tried this? Are you thinking about yeah, and so for my association, we have something similar. We get together every other week, all the directors of the parks, you know, with some of them, Research Triangle Park, I think has 300 buildings, and they're trying to manage, and different expectations also, because you have some uh, tenants that want to come, and some that are fine with just doing things remotely. But, I mean, on the research side, as Julie said, you can't do a Zoom meeting on life science research, but most of the labs, you know, they already have bio safety level one, two, or three. So they already were okay. And they had distancing and they have ventilation and they have things like that. So it's really not so much the research labs per se, but really about the, you know, the administrative staff, the IT people and things like that. And I mean, in general, I think you're seeing less density, but since I kind of am part of the com commercial real estate industry, I, I think what we're going to see, hopefully, is still a demand for buildings, but they're going to be not as dense to, you know, create the space that currently seems to be one of the solutions. Although, at some point, technology with UV lights and a vaccine and things, hopefully, that will change uh, change the approach. Um, great, thank you. So, um, if you worked at a DOE lab and you wanted to set up an innovation district or a cluster around you, how would you start? Do you, you know, do the analysis of the industry around you? Do you um, try and get some favorable uh, local policies in place? What's, what's, the best, what's the best way to go about this? So this is around it. A lab, like a -lab. starting with a lab. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll speak and then Brian and others, you should definitely weigh in. I mean, the way that we've been doing it is we realized that we conduct a pretty extensive diagnostic to even understand what you're building from. And that's looking at your regional strengths, right? So what's your regional economy, how it's changed over time, which kinds of clusters are growing, which are, are contracting. 
what kind of talent you have, and then going down in an order of magnitude to the area around you and the kinds of industries, what's clustering. I mean, it's like the level of work that we do to analyze it is pretty extensive. And that's not even looking at the physical. So the physical is then also about where is their land, what land is available, how is it zoned, is it a lot? I mean, this, so there's a whole series of things that is, is effectively and smartly just due diligence because then it sort of creates a pathway for like where would there be some real opportunities to leverage and 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 so you got to do the homework <laughs> there's, just, there's just no way around it yeah i mean hopefully if you're a lab person you um need to understand the local eco ecosystem what's currently there right uh so if you haven't you know been part of the local tech council or whatever um and sort of understanding you know what assets are there uh, again it can be a real estate uh, play and that's what too often these things have where research parks have failed they've been viewed purely as real estate um, it's really the partnership side and, and making sure you understand what current assets are there what current assets you have in your lab uh, and that are accessible to the uh, community and be creative. I mean, one of the things that sort of, <laughs> whenever I go to the NIH campus, they have a beautiful conference center, but it's inside their high security area. So, I mean, I went to a conference there and it took me, it was like going through uh, JFK, waiting to get on a plane and through TSA. It took me like an hour and 10 minutes. And I thought to myself, why didn't they build the, con and the conference center is right on the edge of campus. Why didn't they put the security gates, you know, on the other side? So the conference center, would have to have some security, but uh, much more limited than what you know the main campus needs. And so, thinking through your assets in a way that allows the, the porousness that Julie mentioned uh, is is one of the, the great things. And DOE Labs, I mean, we heard from our ARL person. You know, the security aspect is really important, and some things have to be really highly secure, but not everything does. And and thinking through that because. If you're an academic or you're a corporation, you know, you just don't, when you see somebody with a gun that you have to walk through to go talk to somebody, that's not the best uh, uh, way to get community involvement. Um, I can only join to the, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I can only join the, to, um, the uh, two previous speakers actually. Um, Absolutely, the diagnosis or the mapping. I think in European context, every every single region or case study uh, has started from the mapping, from analysis with uh, Brenda said assets. Um, what are what do you have? What's the basis? Um, there's a lot of uh, mapping done, um, whether it's online or on paper or internal information, but it has to be done to understand where do you start. And then I would say we go through the classical, well, a little bit adapted maybe form of review and how you build up the policy, you connect the community, you reach out to your stakeholders, you try to engage them already into the building process, then you do the policy review, you look into the already existing instruments. In a lot of cases, you're just building uh, a new a new items, new policies, uh, like a new, a new, new cluster associations on top of the existing ones. And this is a necessary third step reviewing what instruments there are. Are there any tax reliefs? Are any programs, co uh, cooperation projects already being funded in the region? Because lots of it's actual duplication. And then you build a roadmap with concrete implementation measures integrated into the overall context of the region or country, city, uh, co regional community, do the monitoring plan for two years, three years, five years, up to the perspective, and then you adjust it. And this is kind of a cycle, life cycle, or a policy uh, <clears throat> or an action plan cycle for for strategic approach to where you stand and where you want to go um, is applicable, I think, universally in lots of places. So the only thing that I want to add is, is in, in addition to doing the homework up front and identifying the partners, I think the other important thing is, is you have to find the working level researchers that want to collaborate. And so, Again, one of the things that we found is, is that if we met with a university or, a, or an industry partner and management went, they always left with a handshake and they always said, yes, we wanna work together, but it's the guy at the bench 
that wants to work with somebody else at a bench. And not all people are, are as good at collaboration. And so what you also have to do is energize the talent in the areas that you identify that can help build and lead partnerships and programs together. Over. Great, thank you. So I think we've hit our extra time, um, but I don't wanna cut the panels off if they have any final thoughts that they wanna share. Well, thank you so much. I, I know that um, you know, we've gotten great comments already about how much everyone appreciated this. And I, I think this has given us a ton to think about. So thank, thank you, you again. Thank you for inviting us. It was, it was fun. Keep the conversations right. going. That's why I said, right? right? Yes, we will. Thank All right. you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, well done. Great talk.